Hi guys, Jimmy McIntyre here. Today we're going to look at seven different ways exposure blending in Photoshop is more superior to HDR software. Now before we begin, I've actually got a sale on all of my products including Raya Pro and my training courses which will last until Saturday at noon uh, London time. And I only do two sales a year so please feel free to take advantage of that and you can see more details in the description of this video on YouTube where you can see links to the products and the discounts available. Now I don't want to be too harsh on HDR software because it has served a very good purpose but I just feel like it's coming to an end now. You know I used it years and years ago and I was really excited when I first started using it but after a while I looked at other images online and there was just so much better than mine. You know the quality was completely, uh, it was just a different world and so after a while I started learning exposure blending and everything changed then. The quality of my images improved drastically and I've never really looked back. Now in this video we're going to look at different types of HDR software so we're going to look at Photomatics, uh, NIC HDR FX and we'll even have a quick look at 32-bit processing. But it's important to say that not all HDR software is the same. You know it's all different, they all have their different form of tone mapping, some have exposure fusion like for, uh, Photomatics. But regardless of that I still think exposure blending is far more superior and we're going to find out how right now. So the first advantage that exposure blending gives us ahead of HDR is with moving objects. Often when we shoot images we'll have exposures which have moving objects which are in different places. For example here we have this lady in the foreground but in the darker exposure she's in a slightly different area and we have a car coming in to the right here. So in HDR this is commonly known as ghosting and HDR software has often had a very difficult time in dealing with ghosting. So I've got those same two exposures in Photomatics and you can see when it's merged the exposures we have ghosting here. We have this lady in two different places and we have the car kind of superimposed on the road. Now this is actually Photomatics' de-ghosting options. So we can remove the ghost just by drawing around the area that's affected. Then we can click on preview de-ghosting and it removes the duplicated area or the ghosts. And we can press OK. Now this is what we get in Photomatics and it's just on the default setting. So the first problem we have, I'm not sure if you can see this on the video, but around this area of the road it's lighter than the area around it, so the area to the left. And this is where we deghost it. You see it's a little bit inconsistent. If you go into Photoshop and look at that same area, there isn't a difference in brightness around here. But there is here. And it's very subtle, it's not too bad. But if we zoom into this lady, you can see there's a very soft haze around this lady. And that generally happens when you deghost. I just don't think Photomatics knows how to handle these situations. It seems to be compensating or overcompensating for the lack of an extra exposure there. But it hasn't done an absolutely terrible job. We could probably live with that. Now, what about exposure blending? How does that give us an advantage? Well, here we have our darker exposure and there we have our base exposure. All we want from the darker exposure is some of the sky here. That's it, not too much. But when you use HDR software, it affects the whole image. And all we want to do is just affect the sky. And there are no moving objects in the sky. So I'm going to create a black mask on the darker exposure. I'm going to reduce the darker exposure all the way down to around 35% because we just want a little bit of the sky. I'm going to go to my luminosity masks. I'm going to create some bright ones. And then I think I'm going to use darks too. We can see the mask there. We just want a selection of the sky and a little bit of the building at the end. And now I can press Command and H or Control and H to hide the marching ants. And now I just paint in the darker exposure very gently. We don't want too much there. And if we want, we can make a smaller brush and we can paint it in over here too and there as well. And even in this light here if we wanted. And you see we're not affecting any other part of the image so it doesn't affect the moving objects. That's the before and after. We're just recovering some of the sky very gently. We don't want it to be too dark. So as you can see exposure blending gives us a distinct advantage with most moving objects. And this links into the next advantage exposure blending gives us. And that is one of control. And control is extremely important in the creative process. For example in HDR all of the changes we make are across the entire image and whenever that happens we tend to lose a little bit of control. Sometimes it's fine and sometimes that's not. But 
Let's say, for example, we just wanted to add some warmth to the sky. Well, the sky is coming from just the darker exposure now. We've replaced the sky from the brighter exposure with the one from the darker exposure. So let's say if I open up a photo filter, I can create a clipping mask so it goes only to the darker exposure. And watch, I can increase the warmth of just the sky. So again, we are gaining more control over our image. And if we wanted to create a kind of hipster feel, we can add some blues to the shadows. And we can do that by choosing the bottom layer because that controls everything else in our image. We can go to blue and there you go. We can add some cool blues to the shadow, which seems to be quite trendy nowadays. So exposure blending not only helps with moving objects, it also gives us more control over our image. Whenever we use tone mapping, we can't help but affect the colors. It's part of the process of tone mapping. So this is the original scene. I haven't done anything to these colors. This is the darker exposure, that's the brighter exposure. Now I ran this through Photomatics using the default uh, setting. And I, of course I could have reduced the, the saturation. But as you can see, this is fairly typical of Photomatics HDR. We've seen it a million times on the internet. Now, even if I've reduced the saturation of this, we're still affecting the colors uniformly across all of our image, which isn't what we want, and it removes some of that control. Now, I also did the same thing with Nick HDRFX. And as you can see, the coloring is a little bit better, but it's still affected the color in our image. It's still not as natural as it would have been, but it's a big improvement on Photomatics. Now, what about 32-bit HDR? Now, a lot of people are going on about 32-bit and they're very excited by it. But for me, we're still a long way from getting the actual benefit from 32-bit images because our monitors simply can't render 32-bit images. And we still lose some of the advantages of exposure blending because, again, we're making changes across the entire image. So it still affects things like moving objects. But what about colors? What about a simple scene like this where we have our natural colors? Well. I'm going to go to File, Automate, and Merge to HDR Pro. And I'm going to use Add Open Files and just press OK. Then I'll choose these exposures and just remove them. And now these are the two images we're going to work with, and I'll just press OK. So now I've set the mode to 32-bit, and I can tone in ACR, and we've merged our exposures. Now with Adobe Camera Raw open, we need to bring back the highlights and bring up some of the shadows. So we're bringing back the highlights and bringing up some of the shadows. And you can see it doesn't have quite the dynamic range that we would want. We still have a very bright area here, for example. Now, I, those are the only changes I'm gonna make. I'm gonna press okay. So the first thing we'll notice, even with the 32 bit, is that some of the sky here has turned a purple kind of blue. You can see the tones are different. If we go to our original exposures and zoom in, this is the color of the sky, that's the color of the clouds but the sky and clouds here are a different color. And again, as I say, it's slightly purpley. So even with 32-bit HDR, which looks much more natural to some degree than the other versions of HDR, we're still affecting the colors. Now let's look at exposure blending instead. I'm just gonna get these two exposures. This is my dark exposure, that's the bright exposure. And I'm just gonna go to Raya Pro, choose Quick Blending, make my darker exposure invisible, and just go to Dark 2. Now I can make that visible again, and you'll see we haven't affected the colors in any way. When we use exposure blending, we don't affect the original files. The colors should be the same, the chromatic aberration should be the same, everything should be exactly the same. We're just replacing one part of one exposure with another part from a different exposure. That's it. So as you can see, the colors have remained untouched. And do you remember the second point when I said we get more control over our images? Well, just like we did before, we can create an adjustment layer, like a curves. We can make it a clipping mask, so it's only affecting the darker exposure. And we can create some contrast. And you can see we're adding some nice contrast to the sky without affecting the foreground. Or we could select the background. We could create another contrast adjustment, and this time brighten it up, maybe not too much. And give it some contrast in the shadows. So we're affecting individual parts of the image. Or we could go one further. We could choose just the darker exposure, go to filter, camera raw filter, and let's say we wanna give the sky, the clouds, a lot of contrast. We can just 
add loads of clarity. Now this is a little bit too much. I'm just doing it for uh, effect so you can see it on the video. And then I can press OK. And this is before and this is after. So you can see we're only affecting the clouds. We're not affecting the rest of the image. So essentially we're giving ourselves more control over the exposure blending process, but also over the entire workflow. And you can see the colors are far more natural in the exposure blended image. And this example image actually leads us on to the next point, and that's details. So when you use HDR software, often you'll get enhanced details like this. Or if you go to Nick HDR effects, it'll be more grungy, it'll be more detailed and a little bit sharper. The thing with details is it's great, especially when we first start in photography and in HDR, we get very excited when we pull out all of these details that weren't there in the original file. The problem is it becomes overwhelming for people looking at your images. When you have details everywhere, there's just too much to take in. And the more you take photographs and the, the more refined your eye becomes, the more you realize that we have to control which areas we bring out textures and which areas we don't. And having a blanket uniform explosion of details is just a little bit too much and it takes away some of the control that we talked about earlier. So if we zoom in 100% on this image, for example, you can see we have a lot of detail and texture pretty much everywhere. But if you go to the original image and go to 100%, the textures are exactly as they were when I shot them. We haven't changed them in any way, shape or form. So when we added more detail in the sky, in the clouds before, we were selectively adding texture in there. And that was more important than just throwing in textures everywhere. Often when we see the most garish HDR, it's because the colors aren't just the only thing that's overwhelming. It's the fact that every single detail is exaggerated. So my advice is try to avoid that even when you're using HDR software. Try to go for an effect that isn't too strong and doesn't pull out all of your details. The next benefit of exposure blending is halos. You know, we just don't get them in exposure blending. They just don't happen. But in HDR software, uh, it's fairly common. You know, I'm sure you've all seen images where there's been an object with a big white glow around it. And maybe I'm being a bit harsh on HDR software here because generally you can easily process images in HDR software without halos. Often people just push the sliders too far and that's where the halos come from. But with the exposure blending, you know, it just doesn't happen. It isn't possible. Another major benefit of exposure blending is that we come up with generally cleaner images. And I know we just talked about that in terms of color, but I'm talking about noise and sharpness. Sometimes when we're shooting, we have to shoot at higher ISOs. We just don't have a choice. For example, in this image, I was hanging upside down from a building. It was really windy. I had to use a very quick shutter speed. And essentially I was shooting at an ISO of 1000. And now when it comes to exposure blending, that's fine. You know, we can work with a thousand ISO. It isn't really going to be a big issue, depending on your camera, of course. But if we take these very same files into Photomatics, things just go crazy. You know, anything above 400 ISO, it almost falls to pieces. So for example, I've pulled them into Photomatics and here are the images. And we've just gone for the default processing in tone mapping in Detail Enhancer. And if I zoom into, let's say this particular area, Look at the incredible noise in the background there. And here as well, a huge amount of noise. Now, Photomatics does give you a noise removal option, but the thing is, it's just a uniform blanket change across your entire image. It will reduce noise everywhere. And usually, if we have to do noise reduction, we want to make it very local and very specific to areas where it's obvious that we have noise. Because some areas we don't want to remove noise from because it'll also soften the textures in our image. So again, we want full control over the noise removal process, but Photomatics doesn't give that, nor does any other HDR software out there. Now let's have a look at this in terms of exposure blending. I'm going to open up Photoshop. Here are our images, and I'm just going to go straight to bright one. And we've very quickly blended the exposures. You can see it all looks very natural. Um, we've brightened our image. And now if we just zoom into these same areas that we zoomed into in Photomatics, look at the difference in noise. There's a huge difference there. And the reason why is because, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about color, we're not affecting the raw files or the original files in any way. So whatever noise there was when you first shot the image, depending on how you've manipulated the images in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, you'll have the same amount of noise after exposure blending. There's no difference. And this, we're zooming in at 309% here. 
If we zoom into 100%, that's just green. It's totally workable. It's not an issue at all. But in photomatics, it's a huge issue. And I just can't work with that level of noise. And another aspect of quality is sharpness. For example, if we just zoom into this Poseidon sign and we zoom into the same area on my digitally blended exposure, we can see on my blended image, we can see that Photomatics has drastically softened that sign. Now, Nick HDR effects will give a sharper effect, but it also does add noise to the scene as well. So it's one or the other, there's no real compromise here. So using Photomatics will soften your image and create added noise depending on the setting that you use. You could also use something like Exposure Fusion, uh, which personally I don't really like very much. It doesn't give you many options, but let's just brighten this up a little bit and click in that area again and you'll see we've still got added noise, added color noise there now. And we go here to the Poseidon sign and it's still got added noise there and it's sharper than the exposure blending version in Photoshop. So it seems no matter what process you use, we cannot improve upon using those original files in Photoshop. And the final advantage of exposure blending ahead of HDR is that we can work with a single raw file and pull out a huge amount of information from that file in a very clean way that we can't do in HDR software. For example, there's something called double processing or triple processing, and I've already released a video on this on my YouTube channel, so you can see a link to this in the description of the video, and it shows you how to duplicate the files if you only have one raw file and to come out with a very rounded, balanced image. You can do something similar in Photomatics and Nick HDRFX where you duplicate the same file and you merge them, but just watch how much noise is thrown up in that process compared to exposure blending. And that's it for the exposure blending versus HDR video. Now, I know some people might comment on the video saying it's a matter of taste. You know, some people like HDR and I can't tell them what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And you're right, I can't tell people what to do. And it is a matter of personal taste. But this is also my YouTube channel and my video, so naturally I'm going to give you my biased opinion. You know, that's how these things work. But either way, I hope you enjoyed my side of the argument. And if you have, please feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. And there's plenty of exposure blending tutorials on my YouTube channel. Just have a little look through and I'm sure you'll enjoy them. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.